That's not a hot take whatsoever. And we'll we'll let that on the air. But I'm gonna k- Henry Kissinger. What, what you said before with Dick Cheney. Uh, I don't know how it, that's gonna work. You're making this a much more mild take. This is not a spicy take. That's fine, but what you said before was not that at all. I'm gonna that we might actually. <laughs> legal. I'm gonna and I'm gonna that that legally. I think we can't put in the podcast. <laughs> That's just actually <laughs> fake news. That's not illegal. That's just like, okay, you're wrong. Oh, man. Well, listeners, We're you should be a- very interested in what's going to happen in the rest of the show now. I, Who I, knows what's going to happen? I'm sure as hell not. I wish <laughs> there was some way I could go back and erase that whole intro. What? Oh, my God. What a transition. Is that a transition? Oh, right. We're doing a movie called The Time Machine. <laughs> Today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I don't want to say my name just in case the government is listening to this. Uh, it's Austin. Yeah, it is Austin. So, yeah, we're doing the 1960 film, The Time Machine, today. And this was Austin's pick. So if he's recovered from his various incriminating statements, I'm going to ask him to explain his choices right now. I'm just going to say that this is a satire podcast. And sometimes you have to say controversial things to get some attention. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, um, this is satire. I'd like to clarify that I have no association with Austin, and no, not at all. I have. Who nev- are you? I have never met him before in my life, and I do not. Yeah, his views do not reflect on mine or the Spectator Film podcasts. Uh, and furthermore, uh, this is uh, not official financial advice. So I think we've got all our bases covered. You can't sue us. Don't try this at home. Uh, we did all this in a video game, so stop it. Uh, but anyway. The movie we're talking about is Time Machine, like you said, The Time Machine, the classic George Powell production, and I have no clue why I chose this. It is weird that you chose this. Yeah. We had, like, high-class artsy movies or just, like, really fun movies that we're passionate about lined up, and you're like, no, let's not do those. I'm like, oh, okay, so Austin has an idea then. He knows what movie he wants to do, and he's like, do you want to do, like, The Time Machine like, I okay, I vaguely remember watching that movie when I was young. Sure, do you have a hot take on it? Is it relevant again? Are they remaking it? No. Let's just do the time machine. No, they're probably remaking it now after you've said that. Yes, I've willed it into existence. Yeah. And yes, they did remake it, what, 1990? Around then? Uh, but, around 2000 or so. I saw that as a kid, too. I did not, but... It was dumb. I'm sure... It would, Really, the Morlocks didn't <laughs> translate well into the 90s or 2000s. Yeah, that's all what I remember. What a surprise. I don't remember anything about it. I just remember the vibe from when I was a kid. And I was like, this I don't like. Well, it, it could be boring as a kid also. Yeah. Like this movie, I remember not being that interested in. I believe I rented it from the local library because the Morlocks were in a book of monsters. Holy shit. This is such a local library movie. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but it is. It be- is. Because I got a book from my local library about like, famous movie monster suits and whatnot and the Morlocks were <laughs> in that. So like, they're I, pretty fun. I have to see that and then they're not in the movie for yeah. 95% of it. But no, I uh, I don't know. I, I just was like, hey, maybe it was because like we're approaching a year under quarantine here in the US and it's like my mind is like, ha- like my left foot is still stuck in like last March. And it's like, what's happening? I feel like I'm like disjointed from time. Maybe that's it. The other movie we were talking about baby doing was The Big Clock. So I have time on the brain, apparently. I don't know why. Um, but no, I, I have no super strong feelings about this movie. I will say it kind of gives me like comfort food vibes where it's like not that great, but it's like I just enjoy it. So shut up. Um, and I don't know. There's There's other fun things to talk about. I will say, despite having no real like angle I'm coming at this movie with, uh, I feel like there's a lot of neat stuff to be said about the like time travel device in this movie and treating this movie as a kind of like urtext or like landmark point for like time travel movies in film history. Because obviously this story is one of the big landmarks in time travel stories. And it's become a whole genre of different movies that spin off in any which direction, uh, twisting the concept in their own way, right? Whether it's Terminator or Time Bandits, another movie we've done on the show and one I'm sure we'll compare it to uh, during the commentary track. But I I feel like after revisiting it, it's not a movie that I really love. It's just one that I'm kind of charmed by in a lot of ways. I like the special effects, and I just, again, I, I feel like it plays with the time machine mechanic stuff uh, in a fun way. And uh, yeah, I, I have some quotes uh, from a book 
the number what, to read. What a surprise. That's very unlike you. But I'm curious, Max. So you saw this as a kid, and then are you equally kind of amb- ambivalent about this movie? So just... I, I kind of remembered this movie in a certain way that you do when you watch movies as a kid. And I wasn't enthralled by this movie. I remember being... Library movies. Yeah. Perhaps. I remember being very bored by it as a kid for the majority of Oh, it. you didn't like Rod Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> so fucking charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> but no, because like the vast majority of the movie... Well, a lot of the, I do remember, I liked the earlier movie stuff before because like you can see the, the sped up camera footage and the, like the miniature sets and the actual props. I liked all of that, but like a lot of it is just fucking people talking. And one thing I'm going to bring up is this movie, although it came out in 1960, it is very much a 1950s B movie Yes, in various, various aspects. Despite its budget, it has an A movie budget, uh, Oscar winning special effects, but B-movie vibes. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, as an interesting framing device, which I kind of like, but... Of him telling the story? Yes, I, yeah. I like that. And it's it's very H.G. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. It's very H.G. Wells. The character's it. name is George Wells. Yeah. <gasps> but it, it gets very, like, well, you can't prove this didn't happen vibes. Ho, ho, ho. Which I, I like that tone. And yeah, comfort food is a good descriptor of this movie. There are some things that I kind of got that I'm like, yikes vibes this time watching it. I hate to be that guy. Because, yikes like, vibes. Like what? Racism or something? Racism sectioning off of different human ways of thinking and just... There is some race science in this. Yeah. Yeah. This movie has... And I hate to be that guy because I know we did Taken and like that entire episode was us just being like, kill Bill Siren's racism. <laughs> <laughs> but... It is kind of evident in this movie to a degree, and I'm not sure if it was conscious because I think this movie's goal is more talking about human propensity for war and how it would take a complete reset of human civilization in order to breed that out of us. And we are, I mean, I believe H.G. Wells is kind of like a famous leftist. I know in movies like Time After Time, at the very least, he's depicted as someone who very specifically is like, socialism is the future, people. And then in 1899, his friends are like, you're naive. You have no idea what you're talking. Time after time, by the way, another really fun spin on this type of movie with Malcolm McDowell playing H.G. Wells. Well, maybe that's why his the friends in this movie are so fucking insufferable. <laughs> maybe all of oh, his friends were. Little exposition pigs. Those little fucks. But no, I... Uh, Who cares about time travel? Can it make you money? Yes, yeah, infinite money. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, we'll, we'll get to it, but that's the funniest line where it's like... But what are we supposed to do with this contraption? It's like, I don't fucking know. Invent money? Invent money, go to the future. And Steal s- Jesus? See Make him a carnival freak? See who, even just like, even stupid people who can only see past like their wallet, like that's the extent of their forward thinking. Huh, I have some stocks I'm going to invest in. Let's go two weeks in the future and see what stocks are going <laughs> to fucking bloom oh cool i am now doge pilled yes that's <laughs> that's the least creative thing you could think of to do with a time machine and you yes. can't even think of that oh my, my God. guy yeah so we're gonna have lots of fun things to talk there's lots of stuff like that you can poke holes in this movie but it's still enjoyable right sure well i'm hoping for a little bit more enthusiasm than that frankly i would say the first don't make me upset i'm gonna have to again I'm going to have to do so much bleeping out or we're not get this episode removed. Is that actually illegal to say? Yes. Oh, 100% man. illegal. In a video game, I'm going to do it. There's a famous comedy sketch making fun of that, though, <laughs> where they're just like, did you know it's illegal to say... Uh, Harry Hole. You can't say that. It's especially illegal to say... Harry Hole. With a grenade launcher from the third floor of this building because it has the best vantage point. And it's just like instructions for how to... <laughs> in more and more detail by being like... It's illegal to say this, <laughs> but it's fine for me to say this because I'm just explaining it to you. What if I said as like an addendum to all my threats that I was saying an, a PSA that it was illegal? Then that's fine. Okay. So we're good. Yeah, sure. Um, that being said, we may still be sued for wasting everyone's time on this podcast. If we haven't been sued already for wasting people's time, then I think we're in the clear. But before we jump into the commentary track, I do want to quote from uh, some cool resources that I found that, of course, will be linked to in the show notes. And um, I first, before I lead into this quote, I want to bring up an image for an audience, for our audience, an image that I brought up to you before we did our prep screening. 
the idea of think of imagine yourself 1905 you're in a carnival fairground right and you see this weird train car sitting in the middle of the fairground you're like what is that oh yes you're there with your girlfriend and she's like i'm hungry so you're gonna like okay we're gonna go eat and uh you're going inside this train car turns out it's a restaurant right and now what i want everyone to do uh, who's listening to this, is I want you to take your phone, I want you to Google Hales Tours 1904, H-A-L-E. Or you can just link in the show notes. That's true, but if you Google it, it'll be a really great, smooth experience for you guys. Um, it'll be almost like you're in here with this room with us. Um, but basically, what this device is, is this interesting idea that they had celebrating the novelty of film and trying to capitalize it on a carnival setting. We've talked a lot about the... Th- the uh, cinema of attractions, it's called, coined by Tom Gunning, that term. And this was one part of it where people would go in these train cars and they would just sit there while film reels played outside the windows. It was a stationary train car, almost like a carnival ride, you know? And it would be like, oh, we're seeing all these exotic places that we've only ever seen in like photographs or whatever. And now it's almost like we're there. We're watching film of it. It's like we're looking out the window in the train. And this movie is kind of like a meta take on that. Um, I'm not saying the movie is exactly that smart, but it's kind of inherent in the concept. It's like, if uh, here's another way of talking about it, right? We've talked on the show before about how like sci-fi and Western are kind of comparable genres in the way that they both extrapolate uh, fears or anxieties about the present into the future, if it's sci-fi, and then the past, if it's a Western, right? Uh, the sort of fantasy you're constructing in the future will be based on what you extrapolate from the present. And this movie is kind of doing that. It's taking that mechanic and it's making it literally part of the plot where it's like, oh, the future is an extrapolated part of the anxieties of the present. And that sort of makes the uh, the main character, George Wells, in this book, Rod Taylor, kind of like a cinema spectator. And it's very interesting. But the quote I wanted to lead into with all of that is something by Anne Friedberg from her book, Window Shopping, Cinema and the Postmodern, which, of course, I will link to in the show notes. And she basically came up with this concept called the mobilized virtual gaze uh, and tied it to this characteristic of modernity. Um, and then also developing in the 19th to 20th century. And uh, she writes that it is, uh, the virtual gaze is not a direct perception, but a received perception mediated through representation. I introduce, I being her, this compound term in order to describe a gaze that travels in an imaginary flanery, French word, uh, through an imaginary elsewhere and imaginary elsewhen. Right. So that's another way of saying everything we've just said. It's like this movie is about a sort of spectator going through these imaginary spaces. And I think that's an interesting way to look at this movie and then see how you can like compare that to the other time travel movies that we've done on the show and exist. Well, I think that we should be a spectator viewing these times and places by starting the oh movie. Oh my God. We have to start the movie. Let's go. I miss the lion and the <laughs> What do you mean you miss the lion? We don't get this anymore. Just What the, are you talking about? The the roaring lion at the beginning of things. I don't know. It brings me back to like Tom and Jerry cartoon era. Yes, we do. I don't see it anymore. The MGM line? Yeah. It's because they don't release a lot of movies. That's true, I guess. They were almost out of business, like almost ten years ago. Uh the yeah. only thing that saved them was like James Bond. We have this goofy fucking time yes, time piece is going around very abstract they're letting us know max that we're going on a journey through time yes this is i mean this is a better budget than doctor who ever got at the time oh period, i knew we were going to bring up doctor who well we're going to bring up various time travel things and whatnot but like this reminds me of just like <laughs> old school doctor who of just like the tardis flying by a string through time it just looks that cheesy does doctor who suck now um I don't want to go into like full Doctor Who discourse because everybody. Who are their fans like very vindictive? Well, yeah, but I, I really don't want to go into the full spectrum right. of it. I'll take your word for it's it. It's gone a different direction. Thankfully, Stephen Moffat is not directing it anymore. He, Who he, is that? He, for a while, basically was in charge of every show at the BBC. Like he was in charge of Sherlock as well. 
Um, Ooh, that see, I get the impression that that is terrible. Yes, that show. It, it was. Um, Stephen Moffat is good when somebody holds a gun to his head and said, "No, you need to finish this plot in one episode." But otherwise, so if I'm in charge, yeah. So, yeah. but if you don't do that, he will build up for an entire season and then realize he has no ending for it, leave you just wanting more, and then start a new plot thread, which he'll build up for. Which, despite a lot of great actors and a lot of other writers trying to get around that in his tenure running Doctor Who, did kind of bring the show down a bit. But what are you going to do? I I stopped watching a little bit of the way after Peter Capaldi. Started. You watched Doctor Who? Yeah, I watched it for a while. Oh, okay. I didn't watch much of the original. Um, it's in the same boat as original Star Trek. So you me. skipped the ones with Peter Cushing? No, I, I went back and watched some of the old stuff. Okay. But, like, afterwards. But I started with... Uh, the Ninth Doctor, which was the beginning of the New Who revival. Well, it's all the same thing to me. Don't worry about so it. So we have both we have both sides represented on this podcast. Somebody who's kind of seen it and someone who doesn't know. Oh, anything. I watched it religiously for years, but like what the hell? Yeah. I, this has never come up. Dude, no. I, I was on Tumblr for over a decade of I had to watch one of the fucking super who lock trio. And I think I made the right choice there, oh honestly. There needs to be like a rehabilitation camp for people who've been in Tumblr for 10 years. <laughs> we we haven't left. That's the fun thing. Like, we're all enjoying... That's the worst part of it. No. We, Gotta get know, the fuck out. You know why? Why? Because all the disgusting people who only used Tumblr for, like, weird porn have gone to Twitter. It's terrible now. Yeah, I know. Twitter sucks. But Tumblr's great. Tumblr's just a bunch no, of... No, get them the fuck out of here. You t- take them. Tumblr- They're yours. <laughs> Tumblr's just a bunch of chill people reblogging shit all day. No, but- Twitter is like the grandparents who get stuck with these weird-ass teenage kids. I know, but I'm saying Tumblr now is great because all the fucking weirdos went to Twitter. So Tumblr now is just like 10 people locked in a room who refuse to use a new social media platform. Well, you better take them back or else. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Tell Tumblr to unban porn and they'll go back <laughs> instantly, but... Until then. Oh, my God. So anyway, we are watching a movie. Oh, I didn't <laughs> recognize this guy the other day, but I was what? looking up actors. That's uh, Sebastian Cabot. He is mainly known as a voice actor. Um, he voiced... Hilliard? No. Hilliard? The Sebast- guy with the monocle? Sebastian Cabot. The guy with the monocle. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, he's mainly known as a voice actor. You might remember him as the panther from Jungle Book. He's the narrator in Winnie the Pooh. He's in all sorts of famous animated tales. He's a very, very talented voice actor. Oh, that's interesting. Not not in many live action movies. Um, <laughs> his performance in this movie isn't great, but I guess. He's the most incredulous of the friends. Yes, but th- that's more of the material that he's given to work and with. And if you really follow through with the implications of this story, you can maybe even say that World War Three is his fault personally. Because <laughs> as far as we know, he's the only like war industrial industrialist that we see in the movie yeah what else oh uh for live action things he's was also a chris kringle in miracle at on 34th street in which one the og one i believe what let me double check that uh the 1973 one oh, okay i had no idea there was a 1973 one you're talking about the 1947 one and was like max we've already seen that actor in something else they were in them and this is not the same guy yeah no he, but no, he was in the 1973 remake of that as Santa Claus, apparently. Well, I'm sure he did an admirable job <laughs> of a movie that nobody's ever watched. Oh, also The Sword in the Stone, the, that one Disney movie that nobody really remembers. But, uh, but yeah, we, we start off with just a bunch of rich people getting served by an old woman talking about how annoying it is that their friend is late. It's the first scene of many that we're just kind of like waiting for things to happen. Except in this scene, it kind of means more because the the movie is like really deferring your expectations in a way. And in the way that we mentioned in the intro, it's already like playing around with temporality and, uh, you know, the experience of time in a way that's interesting. And it, it protracts that by putting us in the shoes of the characters who are waiting for our lead to arrive. We're waiting for the story to start. I just like all of, why are you friends with these people, my dude? That is a good question. They really, we know nothing about them or their relationship. I mean, Ron Weasley, I get the guy to the left, like the, he's the Scott. Yes. He seems like a good friend. He, he generally cares, even if he's not 100% sure he believes yes. what this guy's saying. He's such a good friend. He'll stay in your house when you ask people to leave. 
Well, they he asked them to leave because they're all just like, listen, we know we saw your model disappear and whatnot, but also you're insane. And even if you did invent time travel, it's dumb because it doesn't make us money for war. <laughs> <laughs> So I would kick my friends out of the house too. But if you're the one guy who's not saying that, then he's like, excuse me. And I have a new year's Eve party to get to five days ago. No. And I, like I said before in the intro, I like this framing device. Tell me more about that. It, it stops the movie from just like, cause the movie could start here, right? Yeah. Like we didn't need that opening technically if we're just, Going bare bones. It could like, begin almost like The Fly. We remember the beginning of The Fly, right? Where it's literally mid-conversation. And uh, it begins with uh, Jeff Goldblum being like... Uh, oh, we're talking wh- about the remake. Okay. Yeah. Where he's like, uh, well, it's uh, it's a special device. It's like, oh, so we're getting right to it. Yeah, no. And you could start here. And yeah. if it was purely the 1950s B-movie that this movie is deep down in its heart, it kind of would. You, you would have these people pulling in in their cars and then getting in. It was just like, you know, I've been doing research about time travel recently. Yeah, they definitely get rid of all the exposition stuff in this moment rather than the uh, first framing device scene. Yeah, which is nice. And it, it gets you invested because you know something's going to happen to this guy. You're not just going to be like, oh, is this movie called The Time Machine? And it's just going to be people talking the entire time. It It gets you ready for this. And I know this is coming off of like... It, the source material is based off of a famous author, so you're going to get an audience regardless. But you still you still want to hook people immediately. But you know some shit's going to go down with him, and it, get, it gets you invested with this character where you might not if it was just this scene to start with. Um, I mean, this guy doing the, what is it, the Bust It Challenge. <laughs> what? While just get, well, explaining the three dimensions might He's be. doing the bus it challenge while explaining the three <laughs> dimensions <laughs> yeah that that's in uh, pretty excuse inf- me Hilio, what are you doing pretty enthralling stuff but the box is three dimensions no it it that's really all i have to say and i don't want to yeah. try to say it in more I, words I mean, it gets I, you invested immediately i think there are other cool things about it too um you're definitely right when when you say that it's kind of superfluous, but when you look at it in that way, the framing device also adds like an extra layer of narration, which going back to what we talked about in the introduction, it's kind of it's kind of playing again with that idea of like a sense of artificiality to all the spectacles of time travel that we're seeing. The story itself is something that's being artificially uh, represented to us through the narration of our main character. It's not something we're seeing for the first time through. So I, I, I do feel like the framing device does add an extra layer to it. Also, before we get too far away, I do want to point out that there are, although the, I wouldn't necessarily consider George Powell like a virtuoso director, um, despite his uh, affinity for making movies with complex and good-looking special effects, uh, I do think there's a fun, there's a few fun camera flourishes in this, and one of them is the transition scene where he's like, five days ago, the last day of 1899, then we transition to a close up. There's a fade, right? We fade close up on the box and then we pull out to establish them in the same room five, day, five days earlier. And there's fun stuff like that where it's like, oh, the box is the time machine and we just faded back in time through the box with a close up of it. There's fun stuff like that. But again, it's, it's highlighting a sort of parallel between cinema and uh, the time travel device itself. Oh, I love this model. It's, it's both so cute. cute. <laughs> it, it, it's cute and ridiculous. Like it's a fully functional model too. Like it's when, so detailed. When they made the first car, did they make a tiny little car that ran on a spoonful <laughs> of gasoline? And did they etch like shit into the like handles of it? Did they have fully functional pedals that you could only? <laughs> <laughs> He was with a toothpick. I love that idea. They didn't do that. <laughs> they had a little tiny gas station. This is a quality model. Honestly, that might just be the reference that they used in making the the bigger special effects stuff that they used as a mock-up, and they're like, yeah, we'll take that, and we'll just use that. Well, from what I understand, I haven't read the original uh, book by H.G. Wells, but... I do understand the design for it was based off of uh, H.G. Wells' childhood love of sleds. So he, they just completely rolled with that for this. Just, what if this was Citizen Kane? 
What the fuck do you mean? Like, Rosebud was a time machine sled. So he could go back and not have his parents give him to a banker for a platinum <laughs> mine or whatever the fuck happened to the That game. is so fucked up. Yeah. Do enough people talk about that? They literally traded their son for, like, money. <laughs> That's like... Um, they sold him to, like, Jeffrey Epstein. It's so <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> no wonder he became an evil psychopath. Fucking... That, that reminds me of... Uh, how Disney traded like one of their highest paid executives to a different company so they could get the rights back to uh, Oswald the Rabbit, one of the first. When ki- did this happen? Uh, I want to say 2010, 2011 or something. Are you serious? Yeah. They, like traded. Wait a second. I had traded no- a guy for the rights to Oswald the Rabbit. <laughs> look this up. It's a crazy story. I don't remember. What the fuck? Look this up. It's fucking hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah. I have to look that up. Oh my God. I, I got to be honest, Max, that's one story is more interesting than anything that happens in this movie. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing about this, and I'll bring this up later, but this movie could have stuck the landing 100%. I think I think it kind of, the ending's kind of wishy-washy a little bit. It's nice. It's sentimental, but you know what would have been nice? We don't have to see it, but because right now he's going to activate the model, and in some groundbreaking special effects for 1960, not being sarcastic at all. This was amazing special effects. As you said, Oscar. They're winning. really well done. Yeah. Yeah. Th- okay. Yes. Gene Warren did win an Oscar for this movie. Yes. Deservedly so, I think. Yeah. So, but no, it, it's a melting plot of miniatures and stop animation and practical effects in terms of makeup and costumes. It's, it's wonderful. I love it. But we see the miniature time machine disappear off the table here. And none of them are convinced by it. Uh, they all think it's a trick or they don't care. Yeah, they're like, this is a parlor gag. Much like a trick from like that cinema of attractions like Fairground. They're like, what is this? Some sort of new Magic Lantern cinema device or something. So something I would have liked is as the friend is leaving at the end of the film, if he just noticed, we don't need to see it reappear. Just have the model on the table. That would be good. Just Just have it there and him notice it as he walks out. Because we don't know how far in time that went, but just just have it like on the table to be like, huh, maybe. Yeah, maybe that that I think that would have helped this movie stick the landing much more than, oh, I bet he dragged his time machine back there so he could. He be- gave me this flower that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be a nice touch. I think that would be a genuine improvement. However, Max, I'm going to offer you an alternative. The idea that I floated to you in the prep screening what if instead of bending one of those his, this, his friend's cigars to make like a little model person to put it in his tiny time machine, he had a mouse. You give the mouse like a little time machine helmet, keep his head safe. Then you pay that off in the third act. The mouse saves him. <laughs> the mouse traveled to... The uh, mouse is the king of the Morlocks. <gasps> yes. And the mouse decides to spare him. And the, the mouse spares him because both of their mother's name are Martha. <laughs> Stay tuned, folks, for the Schneider Cut Justice League episode of the (laughs) Spectator Film Podcast. And the Flash appears and says, it's what's-her-face. Honestly, if anybody in our audience is listening, please let us know. Is anybody actually excited for for the Schneider Cut? There's a lot of people who have, like, as far as movies are concerned, have reached, like, an irony-poisoned level. On, on film Twitter, they're like, I can't wait for this stupid piece of shit. <laughs> no, like, I get that. But, like, there are people who genuinely think this is going to, like, unveil that, like, all of the DC cinematic universe has been corporately sabotaged and that Zack Snyder is a true auteur. It's, I mean, I'm hoping it's terrible, but I am curious to see it. I just want to see them give him I'm full not, because it's so fucking long. Oh, it is going to be, like, five hours, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's rough. And things get cut from a movie for a reason. And like, we all love the platonic idea of a director's cut where it's the studio didn't understand this auteur's vision. So they went in and they cut it up and then the director finally got his movie back. We all want it to be like an Orson Welles director cut. Yeah, an Orson Welles. Touch of evil situation. Or like the most classic example is still Blade Runner. But even then... Even then, he he's continued to fuck his own movie. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's debatable whether or not he completely... Yeah, had complete control over the editing process of the 
re-release of Blade Runner. That's still debated. Oh, really? Yeah. It was more of just... That sounds like an op. Yeah. That means they can sell another one in 10 years. Exactly. The fucking 15th edition of that movie. But we did miss the part where all of his friends are being fucking stupid and saying that time travel has no practical application. Uh, is that even worth commenting about? That's just so ridiculous. That's like... That we, reminds... We, we mentioned it in the cop, like the beginning, but like... Yeah. Holy shit, dude, get some new friends. Why are you friends with these people? Uh, the one part of that, though, that I think is worth going back to, aside from the stupidness of them being, like, unaware of the movie they're in, which is something Rod Taylor will behave that way again a little bit later, uh, there is an interesting sort of trend that begins in that moment, uh, in that conversation specifically, where the Hillier character talks about the Boer War, and I think it's interesting because in every phase of of the time cycles that he goes to, there's a different armed conflict that defines the era. Yeah. And I think it's interesting how it evolves out of the Boer War being the first one and how at the outset it views that as a bad thing. And it's interesting because I feel like this movie, for reasons we'll elaborate on the more we talk about just the general premise of these time travel movies, has can maybe be seen as being inherently conservative in its politics and its view on the world. However, I think it's interesting for it to compare something like the Boer War, a war that, you know, I'm not an expert on, but I believe is viewed mostly as something that's kind of like arbitrary in compared to World War I or World War II well, yeah, or the, Boer, the Cold War. The Boer War was... Just col colonial war. It's, yeah, it's col two colonial powers fucking... Yeah. Ugh. And... That's so much more arbitrary compared to, like, nuclear destruction. It has no meaning. And yet the movie ties them together. I mean, world, you could argue that World War I had no meaning either. But. Oh, I mean, to the utmost. Yeah. I guess my point in bringing this up is, like, I'm thinking of it in comparison to some other movies we've done on the show. Stuff like Village of the Damned, perhaps. Where that movie is also kind of weary and paranoid about the future. And it's like, oh, this weird new generation or whatever... And we talked about in that episode how you can maybe look at that as something that's extrapolating ideas on fears of communism or whatever. Same thing with them, right? Oh, them 100%. That's all it is. But in this movie, you could maybe make the argument that the Morlocks are kind of like that. Oh, if these, like, you know, uh, identical uh, sort of faceless villains win, they will institute this authoritarian system. And make humans cattle. Yeah. However, remember... It ties that back to the Boer War, which is something that England was doing. So it's already a little bit more complicated than just that. It's it's forcing English society to have some sort of connection with the wars that will lead to the Morlocks at the end, which I think is interesting. It's uh, This movie just has me conflicted at a lot of points, because, yeah, on one hand, I I love the the charming special effects. I love me a good time travel movie. They can be very ridiculous. Yeah. But I, I love me some simple time travel premise. And, but on the other hand, there's just some like, what are you trying to say here? And I know HG Wells was more of like a, a it, it was like, it was a sensationalism thing. Like, between this... He was really good at that. Yeah, and yeah. War of the Worlds, which I know like Orson Welles was the one who like blew that up with the radio broadcast yeah. of it. But but still, like stuff like that was considered cutting edge at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's... It's... <laughs> it's now like the best example I can think of a contemporary example, even though it's not that contemporary anymore. It would be like a creepypasta of just <laughs> like... And then you wrote this because you were the one <laughs> in the story. <laughs> I mean... H.G. Wells was a very seriously, uh, like, considered intellectual of his day. And I think it's interesting that he's become more of something that seems to be in line with, like, a pulp writer in comparison to stuff now. However, I do think that Corner has been rounded where people have started to really pick up his writing in a more intellectual way again. Um, and it's come around. Um, but his, his, his literature and writing, it does really have a strong sort of pulpy vibe to it in a yeah. way that maybe Jules Verne does as well, you know? This, like, guy, this guy has the only good argument against it. What is his argument? He just says to destroy it before just, it destroys you. Yeah, because he's like, listen, we're not supposed to fuck around with time. And he has a good point there. Because this movie, well, one, it's early, early time travel fiction before we get into like the 
what happens if you accidentally stop your parents from fucking sure. question that back to the future so boldly went B- but which is also kind of at the core of this movie in a weird in not in a direct way but continue where it's the most simple like he goes to the future he interacts with the future but it doesn't affect anything other than this guy's son remembers him at one point yeah and uh, i don't know you asked me yesterday if i like i was able to time travel when i go to the past or the future i would probably say the past but only if i could do it in a uh christmas carol type way where like yeah i can just observe points in history without you know what, affecting Max? it at all that's a really good reason I, so there are several things i want to go back to what you were talking about um but as far as the Christmas Carol stuff goes, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me of something I want to say about the introduction scene that I thought was kind of clever and fun. Where, again, this this piece of literature, The Time Machine, just published late 1890s, right? This is one of the first major instances of t- treat, like treating time travel as a scientific phenomenon in literature and as like an adventure story. Uh, you can find examples of it earlier, but it seems to be more tied to like mysticism and stuff like that. Um, and one of the strong examples of that is obviously a Christmas Carol. And I think it's fun how this movie begins, uh, in like late December, New Year's Eve. And it's kind of something that you can compare to like Christmas Carol vibes, except it's going to completely take the time travel in a different direction and, and you have that more scientific gaze on everything that's happening rather than, uh, the really mystical one. So I find that fun. And that's obviously a feature of the novel, but I just, I just think it's cool. I did. While we're waiting for the plot to kick in here, I did see recently two things because we all know uh, the best rendition of A Christmas Carol is The Muppets Christmas Carol. And one of my favorite things about that is Michael Caine's condition for being in that movie is he had to be able to play it as seriously as possible. Like it wasn't a Muppets movie. Just like the straight. right call. Yes. Yeah. And it, it works incredibly. But... Also, I didn't know they gave him a Muppet version of himself. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's great. I love it. They gave Is there him... like a picture of him somewhere with like... Not with it, but there's a picture of the Muppet uh, online, which I'll have to send you. All I want is like him wearing identical clothes to the Muppet version of himself holding it <laughs> and having a conversation with himself and then doing an impression of himself. That'd be amazing. But no, Max, the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up, I honestly totally forget. Okay. Thank you for bringing up the fact that you forgot. I appreciate that. No, God damn it. It was going to be something good. Fuck. Couldn't have been that good or you would have remembered it. But we get the full size prop now. You say that, but I'm really disappointing as a human being. So I, it probably was that good and I forgot it. But look at this prop though. It's great. It's very intricate. It's extra. I do want to say though. It has dials and (laughs) If you're watching this with us. Uh, you're going to notice that the edit where we introduce the prop is terrible. It is a terrible edit where he opens the door and I don't know what it was. Maybe they didn't have the right cut or something like it edits at the weirdest moment of him opening the door. And then we just cut to this flat shot of the fucking time machine. If I was directing the scene, I would have him like open the door and we're on the other side of the door as he opens it. And then we track back, right, with a wide-angle lens, and then we see it, and it's huge in the foreground as we continue tracking. Yeah, well, this movie made more money than either of us will see in our lives, so. It did make a lot of money. Who the fuck do you think you are, Austin, telling this movie how to make shots and whatnot? I say, as I said, the ending should have been different. (laughs) (laughs) That's what we do here. We, We don't ever take the risk of making our own movie. We just criticize other people's very hard work. Well, we will at some point. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Once we get all that return on the Doge investment we just made, the Dogecoin investment. All the GameStop stock that we're holding on to. Yes, for listeners in the future, that's what's happening at this particular moment. That's that's this week. (laughs) This week's episode of of Hell. Yeah. Uh, We all became uh, financial journalists, and uh, some Redditors decided to... Reddit actually accidentally made the world realize that money is fake and the stock market is just astrology for rich people. Yes, but, at least young people. Well, no, yeah, millennials and Gen Z, we don't give a fuck about the stark stock market. Yeah, it's, why am I supposed to care about this? It's a line that makes rich people happier, sad. <laughs> and I don't have retirement or savings. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm going to die. I don't have time for That's this. That's our retirement plan yeah. is die. Listen, listeners, I'm out of here by 45. 
We have to be. <laughs> yeah. In this economy, afford- are you kidding me? Yeah. Ridiculous. Get out of here before I get those back problems. If you want to see us live longer, be sure to donate to our Patreon <laughs> so we can afford to keep on living. And listeners who happen to be over the age of 45, not you, just me. You're beautiful. You're perfect. Yes. No, you you obviously have the means to keep going, in which case, great for you. Just uh, The 40-somethings are Gen Xers, right? I don't know. I, I don't have a problem with Gen Xers. But if you're 40-something and listening to this, you're my favorite. Yeah. Gen well, Xer. I appreciate you, Gen Xers. <laughs> go, go back to listening to Sonic Youth and... Pearl Jam, have, have have a grand old time with that. This machine is, I, I don't understand, because if you put the gauge all the way through, you'll go decades at a time super quick. But then if you just do it a little, it's only minutes or seconds. What the fuck are you, cinema sins? Shut up, Max. Shut up. I just want to know how this machine works. It has to do with what you want. You <laughs> yep. have to mean it. But no, I love this sequence. No, it's the sequence. It's great. Some of it's stock footage, obviously. But it's fun. No, it's yeah. The super fast snail. Best part of the movie. Are you kidding me? I love the snail. (laughs) I I mean, this is all stuff where it's like repurposed stock footage playing with temporality. And again, this goes back to that cinema of attraction stuff that we were talking about. That was a big part of the appeal of cinema in its first few decades in its infancy was like, oh, I can see a horse run at like super slow speed. And people were amazed by that. They were shocked by that. Uh, it was it was just a pure spectacle of that. And for that reason, I kind of appreciate that they use documentary footage be- or um, stock footage because it it adds that element to it in a way that I feel like it wouldn't be there if they had just shot it on a studio or something. And again, this the way he's describing it in the narration, even this entire moment the character George Wells is kind of experiencing it as if he's a cinema spectator looking at a montage. And even this, what are we looking at? We're looking at a frame within a frame. Yeah. We're looking at the windows framing this image of time passing. So in a weird way, he's kind of like the, both the director and projectionist simultaneously, uh, controlling what he's seeing, but also viewing it as an audience member. It's really Interesting how that happens. And obviously very different from the the last time travel movie we did on the show, uh, Time Bandits, where uh, if we can recall that episode, there I is can't. there is no device. They just kind of have a map and they're like falling in and out of holes in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> because Time Bandits, the more I think back on that, the more I'm just like... Mm. Oh, come on. You liked it. Uh, it was okay. You didn't like that they were uh, people who had to make the universe in seven days, so there's a bunch of holes everywhere that they couldn't fill? I mean, no, there are, like, quality one-liners in that movie. I just think it's a sloppy movie this overall. This is the second week in a row that you're you're throwing shade at Time Bandits. <laughs> I apologize. Nipples on men, lasers day one. You're not... <laughs> like I said, that's some great one-liners in it, but it's a sloppy movie overall. Yeah. You like David Warner in that movie. Yes. By the way... The movie Time After Time that I keep bringing up with Malcolm McDowell. So the premise of that movie is Malcolm McDowell is H.G. Wells, right? And he's about to write the time machine or whatever. And he's created his own time machine. However, one of the friends, it's it's basically a remake of this movie. One of his friends in the drawing room that he's trying to convince them of the time travel stuff happens to also be Jack the Ripper. And Jack the Ripper steals his time machine and goes to 1981 San Francisco. 1979 San Francisco. Um, and that's the movie is that H.G. Wells, Malcolm McDowell has to change, uh, chase after him. However, do you know who plays Jack the Ripper? I do not. David Warner. Of course. The villain from Time Bandits. There we go. I do think you would like that movie, Max. It's directed by uh, Star Trek alum Nicholas Meyer. That doesn't mean anything. He directed The Wrath of Khan. No, I'm just saying that. Say, oh, this person was in Star Trek. So was everybody in the <laughs> fucking film industry. <laughs> the Rock was in Star Trek. Yeah. Everybody has been in Star Trek. Wasn't did, was Clint Howard in Star Trek? Probably. Wasn't he an ugly baby? <laughs> he was right. He was an ugly baby. Oh yeah, he was. Wasn't he? He was. It was like I, that's that's OG Star Trek. Which they I'm, didn't even have to put the fucking things on his face. Which I'm not as familiar with because. Although I can appreciate its point in history, like a lot of OG Star Trek is just too corny for me. I do appreciate that you've gotten really into uh, 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 what 
the next generation and yeah that one deep space nine yeah i like both of those because i get the impression that it's such a thoroughly fleshed out show and they did so many things it's like they always offer like an interesting reference point for a lot of different plot ideas like they probably did time travel episode right oh they did so many of them yeah were are there any really good ones off the top of your head off the top of my head um No, not that I can think. I, I'm terrible with episode names because normally when I watch Star Trek, it's just like whatever episode from whatever season I feel like putting on Netflix. I'm terrible with the names of them. All right, well, you got to get to work. I'll, I'll I'll send you one and we can put it in the show now. <laughs> That's if you really want me to. Well, my heart, hot Star Trek opinions. They did have to introduce the temporal prime directive in Star Trek, though, which is like, don't, don't fuck with anything if you find yourself back in time. Because that's gonna happen, so just don't don't fuck with anything. Well, what version of time travel do they have? Is it the like paradoxical thing? Yes, paradox one hundred. Okay, so it's not the like determinist version where it's like no matter what you do, it's still going to happen. It's not like Lost. Yeah, I remember in Lost. Well, the where- final episode of Star Trek is a time travel one, kind of. Or really, the Next Generation. Yeah, where uh, people really like that episode. It is. It's like the best way to. And a show ever, <laughs> probably. But it's just, yeah, Picard going through time, like seeing possible futures for what he's going to happen. But it takes place in like three separate things, like when he first got control of the Enterprise right now and the future. And it's interesting to see how everybody treats him at different points in time. Hmm. And it teaches him the lesson to be more compassionate because that's the one thing he doesn't know how to do. Yeah, because that is that is ultimately the perfect time travel story, right? Is that you extrapolate something about the present and the situation in the present into different fantasies of the future and past. If you view, like, especially it's easier on a more literal level to understand it as something like these fantasies are alternate timelines, right? It's like the, they're not your timeline. They're not quote unquote real to you, but there's still things you can step into and participate with that will teach you something about who you are in your own time. I like the idea, by the way. <laughs> so we're seeing the scene where uh, Rod Taylor is interacting with uh, the son of his Scottish friend. Um, who was mentioned earlier. Come yes. by and see we baby James. <laughs> yes. After he paused in 1917 because he was like, so this guy's What's 18, happening? this guy's 18 years old. I was going to bring up, like, how old is this fucking guy supposed to be? 18. Because he's a baby in 1899, and now it's 1917. This guy's a baby-faced 18-year-old. Well, World War I aged people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, I really w- like the idea of, like, some, speaking back to the future, some back to the future 2 version of this, where it's like, oh, they're just humoring him. It's like Rod Taylor is actually insane and this is actually just his friend or something. Like he forgot. <laughs> like they just all know it's like the weird hermit who lives in the house <laughs> over there. And occasionally, every week he'll do this. Yes. And the guy just is like, oh, I have to humor fucking Rod Taylor again. I'm just back from 1899. And it's like, okay, yeah, you knew my dad, right? My yes. dad's dead. I've told you Stop this before. Stop talking to me. <laughs> We're not, whoa, it's Germany. Why? Uh, well, funny story about that. That's actually a very good question. <laughs> Wait a why, minute. Why are we at war, Germany? <laughs> Just pull someone over on the street. Do you, do you know why we're at war? Uh, well, um, actually, uh, a group of Serbian nationalists shot the arch, an archduke of the <laughs> Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, why do we care about that? Well, I don't the, know why we care about that. Uh, because they were allies with. Germany and the Serbia was allies with Russia and then they declared war on France and they had to trespass through Belgium to get to France and we're allies with Belgium. Uh, you know what? No. Why are we in this war? Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> are you telling me we're in this war because a bunch of rich people fucked each other? Created allies? Cestuously? Well, this was the point in the war where uh, Russia was just getting out of it. So they were really fucked because they didn't. They know. really missed their opportunity to be like Red Scare propaganda with this. They should have gone with the full Lenin is a magician, a uh, sorcerer taking over Austin, the world. We missed our opportunity to, to do that movie. You're not. I, it still exists. I'm, What's the name of that movie? I'm, the Lenin is a sorcerer who sent no, Anastasia. He's not a time. sorcerer, but he uses Rasputin as like some sort of evil reanimated zombie. 
I think through Rasputin's own magic. You showed me this movie. You should know this. What? You showed me this movie. Oh, right. Fuck. I was thinking of your stupid Jesus assassination time travel movie. Oh, we got to do that movie. We got to do a time travel We'll, we'll do a double feature of stupid, stupid Christian propaganda movies. Someone sent me this movie. Uh, I'm so sorry. I cannot remember your name. I'm going to look you up and I'm going to say, I'm going to message you after this because I feel so bad about it. You sent me this movie in a direct message on Instagram and uh, it's a movie called like Jesus 33 AD or something. And it's like Jesus is assassinated by Muslims (laughs) from the present to go back in time to assassinate Jesus. Oh, I thought they had to assassinate Jesus in order to make sure he still died. No, 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 no. It's a Christian movie. Yeah, no. I thought they had to assassinate him because him dying is what saves humanity. No, they have to assassinate him before he's on the cross because that's what saves humanity. Oh, my God. There's literally a moment in the trailer where they shoot him in the... They shoot him in the head in the trailer and they go bag him and tag him. And the moment they said that, I started laughing. The movie I'm talking about is yet another the American fascination with Anastasia because we can't get over a bunch of fucking inbred nobles dying in the Russian Revolution. But Anastasia gets teleported to the 1980s for what some fucking reason. (laughs) Rasputin opens a magic portal and then Lenin somehow gains control of Rasputin and sends him to the 1980s after her to try to get her back. Because, yeah, Anastasia can do a whole shit ton of damage to you in the yeah. 1980s. Lenin using voodoo takes control of Rasputin. And take control of your own body so you don't die of a series of strokes, my dude. Maintain <laughs> control of your own fucking government so Stalin doesn't take over. Come on, my man. Oh. <laughs> or at least write in your will that, well, no, he did do that. Sorry. <laughs> don't Don't make the person who's in charge of reading your will to the party. Don't, don't put that in your will that you want him removed from the government. Cause guess what's going to not going to happen. Yeah. And then a lot of bad things are going to happen. Uh, and then years later, people on Fox news are going to think that that was what you meant when you talked about communism was that guy. Tankies do not interact. And I, I, I mean the purest sense of tankies, not, Mm. When liberals don't like socialists, so they just call... I'm going to call myself a tanky from now on. I just mean, like, it. Yeah. Stalin apologists do not interact <laughs> with this podcast. Even still, though, if you're in America, I don't think you can... Like, Stalin apologism in America, and we're totally away from the movie now, but, like, I just got to get this off my well, chest. Well, we're in the Cold War section of the movie, so... That's true. Entirely. We're in 1966. They're about to get bombed. Yeah. Um, by the U.S., I assume. <laughs> um <Those> fucking Brits. <laughs> Take that with your fucking tea and crackers. Um but no, I Stalin apologism in the US is is its own specific thing because we are so propagandized that it is it is very hard for people growing up in the US to gain any sort of accurate idea of what the Soviet Union was or is <laughs> or any idea about it really. Um, without putting in a great deal of effort to learn no, about that. No, and I know there are a good portion of people in Russia today who still think of Stalin as a great historical figure. Like, yeah. If you go to Moscow, there are people like dressed as Stalin in the streets as like a... Have a Stalin day? Is just, they no, a Stalin just, con like Santa con? No, just as like like when you go to like New York here and there's like people dressed as like Lady Liberty or whatnot. It's like a mos- yeah, mascot at this point. Oh, it's people who get photos with. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. I th- I, d- I think that what <laughs> this fucking guy. Sorry, we're talking about Star Trek. This guy looks like he's from an episode of Star Trek. Yeah, I do want to say one detail that's funny to me is that this apparently is in 1966. This moment, and the people are wearing like future outfits made of chrome. It's like that SpongeBob chrome. episode. Yeah. <laughs> I do like this actor's old man performance, though. I that, I was just going to say, I think... The makeup's pretty good. Yeah, but I think the reason he looked like a 30-year-old man as an 18-year-old is so they could just put some old age makeup on him and make you believe he's in his 60s here. Yeah, I mean, he definitely looks older compared to younger, but the makeup is pretty good. They put on, like, a little diaper old man bodysuit on him. <laughs> he, but he's he the only... No, old. he's the only one dressed like this. The rest of the people were kind of dressed normally. No, lots of other people are. The weird thing is that he 
I it's guess it's the, just baggy for him. It's the outfit of the police, Max. This is the police uniform. But the weird thing is the movie is saying this is going to be the police uniform in six years' time. We're going to go to full chrome with people with a W on their helmet. Whatever the fuck that means. Also, if there was a nuke coming, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop and talk with this guy. But that's just me. I don't know. But one thing I wanted to go back, we, we talked over the whole like you know time travel sequence with him getting to this point. One thing I wanted to say, first of all, I find it interesting that they have the pauses in both World War I and this you know future Cold War scene. Because now we're past 1960. We're past the date the movie was released. Yeah, we don't get a pause during World War II, though, other than yeah. like, I realized it was a different war, not the same one. It's like, I, I don't know. I find that kind of interesting. Especially based on the way like World War II, even immediately after its conclusion, is something that is like far more central to the idea of like empire and propaganda and uh, history well, than World War One. So one thing I think this movie struggles with is what message, message is it trying to get across? But I think right now the message it's trying to get across is that humanity will always like it's always going to engage in pointless petty wars that have no real reason yeah and listen the boer war world war one and the cold war all excellent examples of that but especially at the time world war ii is seen as the morally justified that's true that's a good point it is the outlier you're right max you're right because the other three are thematically fitting and world war ii on the other hand i mean World War II is the justified war. That's why it's so central to, especially in America, our understanding of war and how we think about war is because uh, it is the last morally justifiable (sighs) conflict that we were in. The question is, of all the conflicts we've been in, what are are they? Civil war in World War II, is that it? Yeah. That's really justified? I don't know if revolutionary war counts. But, like, World War II is... I don't know. Fuck those Canadians. The War of 1812. (laughs) Yeah, but we got our asses kicked. Yeah, but it felt like we won, so who (laughs) cares? We didn't set up for any repercussions for the War of 1812, so we're fine. We just got a new house or whatever. Um, But no, I... You're right. I mean, World War II is the war that is even remotely justifiable uh, by any standard. And that's not what this movie is about. But it's so fascinating to me because this movie seems like it would be conservative because of the time travel conceit, which I guess I'll explain that now too. Part of the reason why I find time travel movies like this have a tendency to be maybe more conservative is because uh, a lot of them are kind of like pseudo disaster movies. You know, they'll go back in time. It'll be like, you know, a butterfly effect thing. Something will change and then the future will be horrible, right? And we're constantly trying to work back to the future that we were at at the start of the film or the present we were at at the start of the film. But basically what you're doing is you're you have to go into these different fantasy future spaces to reconstruct the status quo at the start of the movie. But the status quo has lots of problems, right? So a lot of these movies establish the status quo as the end goal. And it's like, oh, don't try to change things because then bad things will happen. Well, that's but that's not this movie, though. No. This movie is adamantly... Well, one, since this movie came out in 1960, I said I was kind of disappointed he didn't go to the past, but setting the movie in 1899 and then like going forward, you kind of meet your criteria that way. Yeah. Um, but also, I don't, like, it's very easy to say this movie is conservative in his politics because there are some yikes things later. But, yeah... Is it? Because, like, at the end, he decides to go back and try to rebuild a better future. But he also does it by abandoning the present in any attempt to make the world good then. Yes. So So it's like better things are not possible, and yet they are. It's like having its cake and eating it, too. In the year 8026, or (laughs) 216. Yeah, it's like better things are possible in a different world, but not in this world. So I'm leaving. And it I, is weird. And I know that like evolution takes a long time, but at the very least, these people would be foretold. Like, <laughs> you know, that's the next step in our evolution, right? Four toes. Oh yeah. The pinky toe is uh, going away. Every generation has a progressively smaller pinky toe. Are you serious? Yeah. That's the next thing. Oh my God. <laughs> that's Spe- fascinating. Well, it's because we used to 
they used to be useful for helping us grip onto trees, but we haven't used that in fucking millennia. And so. let me say, that fucking sucks. Yeah. I wish that we all had... Uh, actually, let's not get into, like, feet conversations. Feet conversations online don't go well. Let's, let's <laughs> that, just that's our $10 that. pack Patreon, Terry. You got our yeah. feet episode. <laughs> Matt, Max is going to do a, <laughs> a foot reveal. <laughs> no. I have, like, really tiny pinky toes, just like... Eh. Hey, someone is really enjoying you describing your feet right now. I'm, I'm glad they are, because I'm sure as hell not. There are like 10 points I've wanted to bring up, and we're talking about your pinky. <laughs> what is happening? Um, <laughs> bring up those points, my dude. <laughs> okay. And I wouldn't be talking about my feet now, would I? <laughs> I'm trying. Um, uh, fuck, I forgot. God damn it. I've been drinking for too long now. I always tell Austin, like, hey, man, maybe don't drink that much before the podcast. And you're like, no, I'll be fine. It'll be great. And then through the podcast, you're just like, what the fuck am I talking about? It would happen anyway. I know. But still. It would happen anyway. Let me, let me make fun of you, my dude. Um, we, we literally get transported to the Garden of Eden here. Like, just. Ah! Yeah. That's a big point. I, I think that's an important part of this movie, this sort of, like, you know, uh, uh I don't know, interfering or messing with this mythology of the Garden of Eden. I think it's an example of something that maybe we can compare to the opening sequence where we say like, oh, it's setting it up for something similar to what we would expect from time travel because of its similarity to uh, a Christmas carol, right? Where it's like, oh, this is so similar to like this Edenistic future where it's like people are just enjoying and playing in, in the river and there's no predators, there's nothing happening. Uh, there's... The only thing that's like not Edenistic about this is that they're wearing clothes. That's it. That's the only way they could be more innocent is that if they didn't know they were naked. Yes, but they're being provided the clothes. Yeah. Because the Morlocks apparently are very concerned about human nudity. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> they don't wear clothes themselves, but the Morlocks are just like, listen, I don't want to see any of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to eat you. I don't want to look at you. That's why we give uh, cows sweaters. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Cows aren't naturally black and white spotted. That's that's just the sweaters <laughs> that we've given them over the years. Oh. Little known fact. It'd be cool if I had a cow. I like cows. That's why I don't eat beef. They're, they're sweet animals. My sister uh, saved a cow once. Good for her. A plus to Austin's sister, everybody. Put a thumbs up in chat if you like Austin's sister for All right, saving a cow. You've gone too far. <laughs> you even had to live with her. You not get along with your sibling? Well, Max, we're not going to talk about this on the show. I, okay, sorry. <laughs> but no. Okay. I, I, I just reserve the right to insult anyone in my family. <laughs> no, I get that. <laughs> no, I used to hate my sister. Like, well, <laughs> We both did. We were, teen, we were young kids and teenagers, and we fucking hated each other for the longest time. But we, we get along perfectly now. It <laughs> kind of grew into it after we realized that, like, hey, we need to team up with each other against our parents because otherwise nothing's ever going to get We done. have to unionize. Basically, yeah. yeah. Siblings unionize. So uh, one of the things I want to bring up, one of my points that I've kept forgetting, is uh, how interesting I find this particular method of time travel in this movie compared to later time travel movies where the time travel in this one, very linear, um, where you're just, you're in one spot, right? You don't even move. It's only moving through time, not through space. And you press the lever going back and forth, and it's almost like you're scrubbing back and forward through like a, a VHS tape, you know? That's the only way to go through. You can only experience things in a pure chronological um, timeline. Whereas in something like Time Bandits especially, it is really playing with space, and it is completely disjointed, where they're going back and forth between the future and the past, and there's no connection between where they are and where, where they end up. It almost seems completely random. And I feel like that type of time travel would really take over for the genre because I can't really think of a lot of time travel movies where it's like you have to really like sit in the space and wait for the time to happen. Honestly, the only one other one I can think of is Primer. I can't say I've seen it. Um, it it's kind of interesting. It's probably more interesting to talk about than to... Uh, to watch and the person who made it is a fucking douchebag so as so many <laughs> prominent filmmakers are yeah it's really a shame i t i told you this but i just want to 
recount it for my audience that I have a conspiracy theory friend who always provides me with the hottest new conspiracy theories. That oh, are, that's good. That's a good thing to have. Yes, I, I love him dearly. That's more valuable than like stock tips. And one of them he brought up to me specifically because he knows I'm a big Dario Argento fan. Yeah. Was that uh, Dario Argento funded most of his early movies by directing uh, under underground Italian snuff films at the same time he was making Suspiria and Inferno and stuff like that. For the mafia? No, just as like to fulfill a niche because snuff films were big in Italy at the time, apparently. Max, so, you saying this is like triggering a memory that I don't know is real or not in my head. This might not be real. Okay, this well, might let me just finish be... my... Th- okay, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, so he did that and the reason that all of his movies like recently have been terrible is because producers have been able to blackmail him with that and he can't make movies he wants to anymore. He just has to make garbage for whatever. That doesn't mean it can't be good. No, it's stupid. I'll but, tell you the real reason but why I they're love bad. It. Uh, the real ri- reason why they're bad is uh, two words, Daria Nicolodi. Exactly. Yes. I told him this when he told me the <laughs> conspiracy theory. RIP, by the way. Um, she died somewhat recently uh, I'm sure her appreciation or like the appreciation of her and her con- contribution to horror cinema, especially will go, uh, unsung for the most part, except for people who are in the know. And, uh, even still, even if you just know her as an actor, that's not just what she did on Dario Argento's movie. Uh, she was a co-writer. She was fundamental to a lot of Dario Argento's best movies. Um, absolutely fundamental. Uh, and I really regret that Dario Argento had to be such a fucking priggish idiot uh, in trying to take credit for literally everything and driving their relationship apart. Um, because if they had been able to work together um, more, I don't know, without so much friction, I, I think he would have continued to make really amazing movies. And I would have loved to have seen what she could have done directing. Yeah. Um but I lo- no, I love Argento's work, but like I do get the impression that she was a big part of it. No, yeah. I, not even that's undebatable. Yeah, I'm saying I get the impression that he was a bit of an egomaniac and a bit oh, absolutely, s- somewhat insufferable to the point where it's him. funny. Like he would talk about like taking credit for like Goblin soundtrack, and it's like, can you just shut up? <laughs> like <laughs> you didn't, I you didn't write that music. I'm sorry, <laughs> you didn't write like the best score in horror cinema ever. I'm sorry, <laughs> you hired somebody else to do that. Now you chose Goblin, yeah, which good choice, and you can take credit for choosing them, but then you have to be like, I chose this band who did fucking amazing shit. Yeah, yeah. See, oh God, I don't want to get into it too much, but I always get amazed when people try to take credit for stuff like that because it's like, but when you geek out as a fan, because the thing, he, the reason he chose Goblin is because he was such a big fan of uh, prog rock music. Well, and that's, that's why he that's had why Keith I Emerson love watching, in Inferno. That's why I love watching Guillermo del Toro interviews because he's just a gigantic fucking nerd about these type of things all the entire time. Yeah, you want to get people you're a fan of in your movie, not so you can take credit for their work when they're working on your movie, but so you can also be a fan of their work for your movie. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, here we're introduced to Weena. Weena. The, our female lead, if you can call her that. Uh, she She's... I mean, you can. Yeah, <laughs> the only other major female character is the mannequin. No, and the maid. Thank you very much. She shows up for two seconds. No, she shows up very prominently. I'm in gonna the slap very you. Very prominently. I'm gonna, in the don't end. disagree with me. I'll disagree with all you want, you little bitch. Oh, uh, but yeah, this is a uh, what is her name? Uh, Yvette Mumu, and she was a solid seventeen year olds, seventeen years old when this movie started filming. Um which I know this was the 60s, but still, yikes. And especially with how old early <laughs> it is. Wait, how old was Rod Taylor in this? Can you look that up? I will double check, but definitely significantly older. Eh, it's still not as bad as the later uh, Roger Moore, James Bond movies. Have you ever seen any of those? It's just like, it's just manifestly awkward. You're just looking at him and it's like, I'm sorry, not all the makeup in the world okay, can't not, hide from you being like 55 he was, he years was old. He was 30, but still. Yeah, but still. It, like teenagers stop it she actually wasn't supposed to be working on this movie because she was too young to be working under i believe screen act yeah actors guild rules but they did it anyway and they did reshoot some scenes later when she turned 18 to like fulfill the requirement for like how many scenes she could be in for how old but 
Oh god. Her performance is something. I don't I, I looked up a very strong character. No, I looked up other roles she's been in. It was from what I could tell, small parts in like television shows and some bad other B movies or just low budget films. Um she owns a resort with her husband in Mexico that a lot of celebrities visit now. Is she still alive? Yeah. So good for her. Mm, that sounds like a boomer thing. It sounds like a boomer thing to do to be an actor and then own a fucking resort. Yeah, well, in Mexico. She one hundred percent is a boomer, but like, I, she was born in what, like forty two, forty three. So, around that time, yeah. But hey, you you couldn't really act amazingly, so you just opened a hotel with your husband in Mexico. I guess you could just do that back in the day. Just be like, "Yep, I was in, I was in the time machine. Time to open a hotel in Mexico. I'm white, so I can do anything." Yes. So humans are supposed to be cattle here, right? Like I'm not. Yes. Th- he explicitly says that the Morlocks, they eat them. That's what we learn later is that the Morlocks eat them and it becomes kind of like this, uh, I don't want to say symbiotic, but it's like they're tied to one another where the Morlocks clothe and feed them. Yes. Yeah. And then they're fattening them up. So after a certain age, they put the air raid sirens on and they all, yes. all it seems very sloppy. They say that's why nobody ages, but like the process seems wildly enough not to get cinema sinzy. It seems wildly inefficient where you just turn the air raid sirens on and the humans walk in and then you turn them off after a certain point and everybody else is like, huh, okay, okay then. I guess not this time. I wonder how they hypnotize them. They don't really explain that. But clearly I think it's supposed to be some sort of implication that it grew out of the war the The war war. era. Yeah, like this. Oh, you go underground when the air raid sirens come. It's They're so used to it that it's just like ingrained in their behavior now. Yeah. But also, why the fuck do they still know how to talk? That's a good question. In English. And I know because fuck you, this is a movie and we need to get this point across in an hour Yeah, and but half. also like I have a problem with this every time I see this movie. Whenever whenever movies try to depict like different levels of intelligence and then they have like really incongruous things going along with it, it's just like what the fuck is happening? Like like you can't expect me that people are able to like talk and everything like this and, and yet like no one has read a book in Max, do you know what year he's in? Uh, 800,000 something. No, it was uh, 8,216. Yeah, (laughs) I believe was the exact year. He's almost a million years in the future. Almost 100,000 years in the future. No, he's almost a million. It's Uh, 800,000. We'll check on the machine when it gets back. Uh, He's almost a million years in the future, Max. And uh, you're telling me no one has read the books? And furthermore, when are these fucking books from? You're telling me almost a million years in the future that these books are from, like, what, the 22nd century? They're 10,000-year-old books. I don't know. It's just dumb. At this point, you have to, like, not care about, like, the specific plot elements and more care about, like, you know, just the imagery of what you're seeing and how it's depicting the future. You have to vibe with it on a thematic level. Because if you get cinema sins with... Cinzy with this it's like yeah it doesn't make any fucking sense it's like you're angry at this one guy for letting the books fall into dust it's like you're a million years in the future what the fuck did you think was gonna happen it doesn't matter if you put them at the bottom of like the vault in the vatican the books are gonna turn to ash i'm sorry Why not? That's the dream, my dude. Yeah, that is a. So what we were just saying is, so Rod Taylor just saw the library of the future that they were showing. Oh, we have books here. Do you have books here where I can study your future history or whatever, so I can go back and tell my people about it? The guy's like, yeah, sure. The guy with the terrible bowl haircut he shows Rod Taylor. Rod Taylor grabs the book and it just dissolves in his hand into dust. And then he gets mad at this one particular guy as if it's his fault. Um. And he's like, oh, everybody who uh, the guy who has the defining hairstyle of the future, which is blonde bowl cut. Yes. Beatles haircut. Uh, But basically, Rod Taylor is like, oh, like however many generations of human being have passed, 
just for you to like let all their contributions to society be like completely destroyed and completely lose your history uh, by letting these books dissolve. And uh, just so you can like swim and play in the sun as if you're in the Garden of Eden. And it's like, yeah, that's the goal, right? Like, because as far as he knows right now, they have no natural predators. They have, there's no, doesn't seem to be any illness. Yeah. They don't age, he thinks, at the beginning. Even more disturbingly, we talked about this too. If we're looking at this as a type of Edenistic future, this is maybe where the real racism of the Oh, movie yeah. I was holding from. off on that. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that now? Well, um, they're just, oh, yeah. So everybody, they're just Aryan. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the future is the Aryan master race, apparently. Because, yikes, everybody has pure blonde hair and pure blue eyes and is just running around in this peaceful plant world where everything is abundance and. It's it's just pure, purely great. I mean, obviously, if we're taking the race si- science of this movie at a more li- literal level, that is racism because that's not... If you wanted to be as literal as possible, that would not be the future of the human race because uh, the variance in skin tone between white and black people is so much more s- small than the variance between like black people and other black people. Yeah. The majority of skin tones are between wait, black are, people and other black people. Wait, are you telling me that whiteness is a social construct that we've created over thousands of years in not order to only, exclude people? Not only that, Max. I'm saying that whiteness genetically is the outlier. Well, yeah, because you have to be in places that it's yeah. Yeah, sheltered enough from the sun that you don't need more melanin. Yes, so. whiteness is absolutely the outlier not genetically. A, yes, but like what I'm saying is whiteness is a constructed concept. And yes. It's like... That's why whenever you hear just like white genocide or white extinction and stuff like the red flag is because like, oh, well, if a black person and a white person have a child together, that's getting rid of whiteness. Like, why? Think about that for two seconds. Fucking why? Yes. You you only do that if you assume whiteness is the default and whiteness is good. Like, <sighs> And wh- whiteness is something that can be contaminated. Yes. Yes. Like... You would can you could like blackness is never something that's contaminated. Yeah, like it, Barack Obama considered the first that this is a good black, example. Yeah, black yeah. president of the United States. If in some alternate future you could never call him the first white president of the United <laughs> yes. States, yes, that would not work <laughs> because whiteness is considered something that you lose. And yeah, I know we're just going off on a tangent here, but I think it's relevant to this because. This movie interestingly becomes a movie that's kind of similar to like a colonial type narrative in this second part of it when he winds up in the far future. Uh, the previous episode we did on the show was Master and Commander, and it would have been so easy for that movie to wind up in some sort of situation where they're doing some sort of colonial narrative where there's like, oh, some 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 sort of tribe that we're interacting with uh, after the ship's been like damaged or something, right? That's very much what this is it's it's quite similar um to that type of story uh where this guy comes from the quote unquote more civilized age right he goes into the far future and you have these childlike naive people that he has to go and save from their own oppression and his knowledge of the like the more civilized age doesn't fucking help him at all you know what helps him more than anything the fact that he fucking brought a matchbook with him that's it that's like whenever you see like Oh, if I could go back in time and explain to these people, you couldn't explain shit about why the modern world is great today. Do you know how electricity works in intricate detail? Yeah. Do you know how all of these are? Fuck you, man. Yeah. You're not just because you got born in an age that has more technology doesn't make you better than any other people. History. The amount we've changed since like even cavemen is so fucking small. Yeah. And one thing I think about that with, with that a lot is like, failed versions of like modern day technology in the past, like Romans inventing steam power, but it just doesn't go off the ground because of certain situations. And it's like, what if it did though? You know, like what if their version of like steam power really took off? That's the only way you could influence events somehow (laughs) is if you were like, actually we should really focus on this. And I might actually get super interested in Roman history and not just see it as a, red flag for people but you see it as a red flag yeah whenever people get super passionate about roman history i assume they're a white supremacist but <laughs> that's, that's just me that's true that's an and that's a national rule of thumb right is whenever your country is like we're like rome yeah it's like that's a problem 
That's, Time to go. That's red flag. We're going to bring back the glory of the Roman Empire. Oh, mm. we're putting an eagle on our flag. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, God. <laughs> Max, you got to read the book I, Claudius. It's one of the great works of historical fiction in the 20th century, and it's just so much fun. And it has a sequel, Claudius the God. It's written by a scholar of the classics, Robert Graves. Uh, it oh, is so much locks. fun. Max, you're going to read that book. Now okay. that I've recommended it. But, I, can, I can loan it to you. Okay, that's nice, but we just saw Morlocks. Yes, we just saw the Morlocks. I love how she looks like mildly annoyed by it more than anything. Yes. Oh, fuck. Another well, Max, that's just how naive she is. A Morlock, whatever. And then shit like this is stupid, too. Like I, The fire again, seems to keep them away? How do you know that? You haven't lit a fire yet. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. I know it's cinema sinsy, but it's, it is kind of like... It's frustrating when you see a movie and it's like someone hasn't seen fire before. It's like that has no bearing on humanity. You like you can't even tell me that like primordial humans didn't see fire. They just had to learn how to create it at some point. Yeah. They saw it, though. Fires happen all the time. What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, God. And that's why this is such a colonial narrative is because it strains credulity. You know, it's like no human being, even in some distant primordial time, would interact with the natural world in this way. Even if you saw something that you'd never seen before, Max, how would you interact with it? Would you fucking stick your hand in it? No. <laughs> no. But these are cattle people, you have to remember. Yes. They're, they're stupid, stupid people. And I find it very telling that the only woman that he can show romantic affection. One is somebody who's completely physically and emotionally and mentally dependent on him. Much like that, that mannequin. Yes. <laughs> That's his ability to interact with women. To go back to that mannequin though, I think it's, I, what, what's so fucking funny about that? It's just a funny transition. Okay. To go back to that mannequin though. I just thought I was going to elaborate on his means of time travel and how it's similar to the cinema. And uh, I think it's highlighted in the, his conversation, not conversations, but his comments on the mannequin where he's talking about like, oh, it's sort of like my silent partner who's here with me as I'm traveling. Um, I think it's interesting because both him and the mannequin are separated from the scenes he's witnessing from behind glass. And they're both kind of spectators in their own way, um, even though the, the, you know, the mannequin themselves is there to just be a model and display different lines of clothing as time changes. Uh, I think it's interesting because it's like another thing that makes his form of time travel very cinema, cin cinema like is that it's kind of voyeuristic. He's completely unperceived when he's traveling, you know, he's invisible, which is sort of like being in the film theaters because no one can see you when you're watching a movie. And that's something that's been written about a lot in terms of film theory and, uh, the way people engage with movies. I just find that interesting is that he has this counterpart in the mannequin and the mannequin seems to be a, a similarity in that sense where obviously people are looking at them, but they're separated. Also that whole scene, if you want to read this movie as a conservative film, that I, I don't know how to take the one comment he makes and he's just like, Oh, let's see how far women will take this <laughs> with the fashion. You mean? Yes. And yeah. one, he says that when it's just like a dress showing a woman's ankle, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, my dude. <laughs> but also... It's I like, thought you were supposed to be liberal. Yeah. Yeah. And this movie was made in the 60s, so, like, I assume that's, like, a tongue-in-cheek, like... Well, 1960. No, it's, like, made in 1960. Yeah. But the guy's from 1899, so I think it's them looking back, just, just like, ha-ha, like, look at their standards from back then and what the, what would they think of how we dressed now? But I'm saying the funny thing is, like, if this movie was made five years later, only five years later, they'd be like, wow, this is really fucking different. Because, <laughs> I mean... This yeah, movie, we were just coming off of the atrocity of 50s fashion at the point. So, like, 60s... Eh, not all 50s fashion is bad. It's boring, though. Ava Gardner's from the 50s, though. Listen, women's fashion is always two steps ahead of men's fashion. Ava Gardner. Try to get a suit, and it's always just like, we got gray, we got black. And if you're feeling crazy, we got brown. Men's fashion fucking sucks. I hate it so much. 
I don't know. There has to be a middle ground where like women's fashion seems totally exploitative, where it's like you have to buy a bunch of shit to make your outfit good. But then men's fashion tends to be just like lame. That's the thing. You always see like these super intricate dresses and like <laughs> amazing outfits and men's shows. It's just like, we got this new tuxedo. It's a slightly different cut than the last tuxedo. Y- you know did. what it is, Max? You just have to have a dump truck ass. You just have to have a dump truck I ass. I mean, yeah. Being, and being hot. That's the thing. Whenever we're like, you could just wear anything. Exactly. Whenever we're like, oh, this person has such a good fashion sense. I'm like, no, they're just hot. If you're hot, you can wear a fucking garbage <laughs> bag over you. And people will be like, wow, what a bold stylistic choice. Which is why any of our listeners can wear anything because you are the hottest people. So true. Honestly. You know it. You I can't know believe it. how fucking hot our listeners are. It's it's unnerving, honestly. You can make us sound like Donald Trump, but it's true. We got the hottest listeners. We do. Your party is so hot. Your Oscar okay, party. Okay, Austin, we better stop <laughs> before we scare him off. <laughs> Chill out, man. I'm just trying to gas up our listeners, Max. Has been destroyed. We must die. We get the rings explaining. Yeah, I do like that sign that sci-fi contraption. Yeah, that's never explained either. It's never just like, oh, well, I learned on a terminal that these rings were made. No, it's just a sci-fi device. They don't have to. Yeah, it's cool. Uh that reminds me of another thing that I really appreciate this movie for is how well it manages to coordinate and uh, focus its little details of production, whether it's the stuff like the rings or the music, perhaps, um, to really communicate this, the like depth and the, and the theme and the story of time travel. The music especially is fantastic. It's definitely like a classic movie score. You're not going to listen to it and be like, really pumped up or anything like that but it in that sense it's really great it does a lot of work for communicating and providing the audience different cues for when time travel is happening and different things happening along the way you're going to hear a lot of cues in this movie um and you if you go back and listen to it you're going to hear a lot of cues for like different things happening as he's watching them uh for example when we see the buildings being built after after world war ii you hear like this sort of um you see, I guess it's sort of like um, like a xylophone or something, like ascending a scale or something as the yeah. building is being built. There's lots of clever things like that where it's kind of uh, it's kind of obvious, but it works. Don't you know? kiss the teenager who has no mental capacity that you met 10 minutes ago, please. I'd appreciate it. Are you trying to cancel him? Yes. <laughs> cancel H. George Wells. Give this. It will convince one of your friends of what happened later. Max, just pretend that was a scene where she was 18. <laughs> she's still a teenager if she's 18. Yeah, but I mean... It's just slightly less illegal. <laughs> no, 18's legal. Uh, I know. I If someone's 18, I don't care. If somebody's 18... I try to give respect to people who are young. I do, know, whatever. but also... I know a lot of scummy older people. That's so, true. Like, I... I I don't, I'm not questioning the intentions of the teenager. <laughs> uh, like, I'm not like, fuck you. You should know better. I, you have to take it case by case, right? Mm-hmm. I just think like, I'm questioning the intentions of the 30 year old who thinks that they're emotionally compatible with a teenager. I j- that's true. That's true, Max. <laughs> I just feel that like, you know, we just because people want to keep each other safe and okay doesn't mean we have to veer back into a different type of like pure You have an 18 year old girlfriend soon. That I'm gonna have to stop doing this podcast. If this is our last episode, you know why, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's because Harry Hole. <laughs> if you want to give yourself more work and find whatever fucking timestamp that is to edit it out, good luck for you, man. You better look at the timeline now, because otherwise you're gonna forget immediately. See, the thing is, they're gonna think it's something terrible about an 18 year old, <laughs> and not about the president. <laughs> It was about the president. It was not about teenagers in any capacity. <laughs> and God forbid if we ever have a president that's a teenager. Although I guess that can't be worse. No, unless, well, also, yeah, unless we amend the Constitution, that can't happen. But what are you going to do? Although I don't think there's any age limits for the vice president. Are you serious? Yeah, because that's how Teddy Roosevelt got around it. Because, uh, he was like, he's the youngest president in history. He was like 33 or whatever. Whoa. 
so but I he, didn't know that, Max. But yeah, he was the vice president at the time, and then <laughs> the other guy died. And then he's just like, yeah, I guess I'm president now. So I guess if you ran with the teenagers, you're vice president. Jake Paul, <laughs> vice president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when uh, that'll be, what's his name? Fucking Crenshaw's running mate. Ugh. <laughs> Crenshaw Paul 2024. Ugh. Let's talk about something else. It's okay. It will, they'll be going up against uh, AOC and some fucking left <laughs> tuber for president. That, that'll be the race. <laughs> Dan Crenshaw and fucking Jake Paul versus fucking AOC and uh, ContraPoints, I guess. Just random left tuber person. That 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 will be the future we live in, where YouTubers get celebrities ele- or get people elected. <sighs> that's that's what leads to this future where we don't talk anymore and we get eaten by Morlocks. You know what? It's deserved, though. We should not talk anymore. I know we're contributing to this problem by having a podcast, but really no one should talk. Actually, you know what? Let me amend that. No one should talk except for me. In fact, let me elaborate further. No one should be president except for me. I disagree. <laughs> you guys have no... I idea. wouldn't vote for you. <laughs> That's fine, but it wouldn't matter. I just think I should be emperor of the U.S. I would start things off by ending the U.S. and then starting things over and having Halloween be our Independence Day. It'd be great. Honestly, we should... That that would be my first order of business. <laughs> it's just executive order. Halloween, Halloween is a federal holiday. Yes. Guaranteed time off. Yes. And you get you get the day off after, so you can survive yeah. your hangover. It's a t- it's a two day long festival. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't guessed this by <laughs> by the fact that we do a special month for Halloween and that we never shut up about horror we movies, we fucking love Halloween. It's it, it's objectively the best holiday. Yes, I, I have yet to have somebody argue with me that the holiday is better than Halloween because the age is the best. Because Christmas is fucking amazing when you're a kid, right? Like. Get excited for all these presents, and there's, there's a magical element if you still believe in Santa. But like, as you get older, Christmas fucking sucks. You have to go see all your shitty relatives, and you have it's to. It's true. You have it's to. True. You get socks every year. Which, listen, I love the socks I get every year, but it's not as exciting anymore. Yeah, you're wearing pretty exciting socks right now. You have a. You have. You're. They're not matching. Oh but yeah. In a stylish way, you have a pair of socks that has just like ghosts on it. I have one ghosts, and I have one uh, skulls socks. I decided to mix and match my spooky socks today. Yeah. So yeah, but I I get those. But Halloween, when you're little, you dress up in a costume and you go around and you get candy with your friends. When you're older, you get in a costume, you get shit-faced with your friends. (laughs) It ages perfectly. Yes. When you're older, it's an excuse to wear a slutty outfit. Yeah, or just any fucking outfit because society makes it so like if I feel like I want to dress up as a vampire one day, they're like, oh, that's weird. You shouldn't do that. But then on October 31st, they're like... (laughs) Oh, here's a free drink at a bar. <laughs> oh, man. You're just revealing how much you want to dress up as a vampire all the time. I mean, yeah. But it's fine. You know, it's fine. I'm just imagining you at work wearing, like, a vampire outfit. Oh, I every year at Halloween, I, I let my manager, like, excuse me, sir, can you please put on your mask? This was the first year in, like, I think since my first year working at my job where my manager scheduled me to work on Halloween. Oh! <gasps> And I thought she had learned her lesson <laughs> because what the fuck? Because the first year she did that and I came to work in full costume and she was like, <laughs> what was your outfit? I was, I, I think it was a vampire where I just had like <laughs> a cape, a black robe and some teeth and fake blood. <laughs> and she was like, okay, note to self. Don't schedule Max on Halloween anymore. But this year with COVID, I think she thought I wouldn't do it. But now I, I still came. To did you give him the old uh, Bella Lugosi accent? We were selling stuff. Yeah, but now, what would you like? This year, I just showed up in a like cultist robe that I had in my closet from a previous <laughs> costume. Bring that the next episode, and we'll finally make use of that uh, Ouija board we got. <laughs> That's why it didn't work last time. Of course, we weren't wearing the robes. Yeah. Did we talk about this on the show? Yes, we did. But okay. Oh, the no, the Morlocks eat people. But. Oh my god, this whole thing, speaking of Star Trek, this entire set piece looks like something straight out of Star Trek. <laughs> but you have to admit. No, I love it. The I way l- they give the Morlocks Christmas light eyes. 
is perfect. No, it's great. I love it. But the Morlocks are 100%. Why did he wrap that around if he wasn't planning on lighting it? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> Maybe he didn't want to waste it. I know he only has like five matches left or whatever, but... <sighs> now, Max, we're getting to one of the big pieces of the riddle of the politics of this movie. And that's like, what exactly is the thing that led to the difference between the Morlocks and the Eloi? The yeah. people living underground and the surface dwellers, the monsters and the humans. Uh, I believe in this movie, it's that the monsters, the Morlocks, are the ones who were able to survive underground after the bomb. Yes. Yeah. Which would make them, based on what I'm assuming from this movie, the more privileged upper class. Who literally feed off the, <laughs> yeah. the people that they apparently provide for, but are really just using as cattle so that they can get sustenance from them. Yes, if he if he walked down one other like corridor of this cave, he would find them in the middle of a giant shunt. Sometimes I wish we never did society on this podcast. Why? Because <laughs> you need to get over shunting, my dude. What do you mean? What do you mean I have to get over shunting? I think you know exactly what I mean. But anyway, we're, we're here for the Morlocks. So yeah, you could read it as a class thing. But also they're blue. Daba gee, daba die. Um, but it does bring up that there aren't anything but white people in the future. And the only other kind of people, because Morlocks are people, are cannibalistic slave drivers. And we only see white people and they're and so yikes. And it is important to bring up, too. They are very uh, much shown as, like, slave drivers. Yeah, too, they, in they have situation. whips. They It's basically, we we joked about this. It's but chattel it's, slavery, literally. Like, <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, it's like the same imagery of, like, Temple of Doom, Indiana Jones, basically. Oh, my God. Here here we are with the brightest match in See, history. when I first watched this, yes, like, or when I, I rewatched this yesterday for the pre-screening, I thought he lit the curtains on fire and that big ball of fire caused like the thing that scared them all away. But no, it was just a match to fucking. I, then, I, he, then he looks like he's surprised that worked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the idea that his matches actually worked against the mole people. Yes. I, I think we can all agree that like Hitchcock did it better at the end of rear window when you know, Jimmy Stewart was using the flash bulbs in his camera to blind Mr. Thornwall to blind, spoilers. To blind the Morlocks. <laughs> Do you like that movie, by the way? Rear Window? Yeah. Uh, n Yeah, I like it. It's not a... Uh, doesn't beat out Vertigo or uh, Psycho as some of my favorite Hitchcock, but it's definitely above the birds. <laughs> See, Rear Window, I think, is just, like, so fun to watch. I could watch Rear Window, like, oh, no, it's any definitely, time of day. It's, it's up there. It's just, like... I, I would say Vertigo, Strangers on a Train, and Psycho are probably my favorites. Um, yeah, I know it's cliche to say at this point, but I think I think Vertigo is his best movie. But like, I I would say that Rear Window is maybe the one I, I enjoy watching the most. Oh, that's completely fair. Rear Window or maybe Notorious. Notorious is so fucking good. Psych <sighs> Psycho had to do another Hitchcock yeah. movie. Well, Psycho was a one that like for a while I was just being like the annoying, like, well, that's popular. So I'm going to not like it. But like, yeah, I had a, I re fell in love with that movie. What made you fall in love with it again? Just sort of like rewatching it and just like, listen, there's the problematic trans demon thing that yes. we can talk about. Yeah. Next time we do silence of the lambs or that, or on when <laughs> any of the other numerous movies, any were. of the other Ed Gein inspired <laughs> yeah. movies, but it's just, Wonderful filmmaking, wonderful acting, and Anthony just, Perkins is so good. He that, honestly, that's why. Yeah, Anth Anthony Perkins, like, uh, so yeah, is great. This scene is so fucking goofy. It goes on for way too long, but like, honestly, at this point in the movie, you're like, please, nothing has happened for an hour. <laughs> I'm just so happy to see Morlocks like throw themselves at him. Yeah. 
while people with Beatles haircuts. Oh, I'm just glad stand he's teaching watch. this civilization violence. <laughs> that is kind of what he's doing, right? The guy is looking at his fist like, what, what am I going to do? And then he resists. I mean, yeah, resistance is good, but these people are literally eating him. Wow, he hit that guy so hard, blood came out of his mouth. Just from a half-ass hit on the back. That's like what happens every time we say a joke on the show. Oh. Our, our listeners start bleeding from the nose. <laughs> All of our listeners are masochists. <laughs> it's, it's the only reason they listen to our show. Oh, look at them. I, I want to meet every single person who played a Morlock in this movie. Just be like, you guys have fun that day? Just, gonna, uh. just get to go around and be like... <laughs> More fun than the guy that played Godzilla. I always think about that, like, in terms of the people who played a certain, like, character or whatever. It's like, Godzilla is the most famous person who no one knows. Yeah. Right? By the way, Max. He just died, I believe, two years ago. The original Godzilla. Rest in peace. Can you imagine meeting him? That would be insane. Yeah. That would be like meeting fucking George Washington. (laughs) Can you imagine if we had Mount Rushmore except with Godzilla? I'd be happy with that. I would love that. That's the only, like big blockbuster movie that's going to come to streaming that I plan on buying. Go- Godzilla versus King Kong? Yeah. What what team are you on? Oh, I'm on Godzilla team. Obviously. Yes. Obviously. And Hello. they're not going they're not going to even do the original goofy thing cuz you know the trivia about the original one, the 1962 one? Yeah, how it was supposed to originally be Godzilla versus Frankenstein. Um and they kept the script for that. So that's why when Kong like chews Is on Is that a- why in Germany it's called like Godzilla versus Frankenstein's monster. Yes, um, because the, the Frankenstein fuck? is more popular because Frankenstein's considered like Germany's monster, so they were trying to sell it there. See, I knew it was called that, and I was always like, "Why?" But that's also why Kong like chews on electric wires and gets more powerful at one point in the movie. Because he's supposed to be Frankenstein. Yeah. God damn, that's a terrible. It was supposed idea. to be like Frankenstein made a gigantic kaiju-sized monster and was going to fight him, but then they. You know what, Max? You know what we've got too, though. We've got. In addition to Godzilla coming out, Godzilla vs. King Kong, we got Ultraman coming out, a new Ultraman movie. Yeah, um, from the director of Neon Genesis Evangelion, actually. The 1997 one? Yeah. Um, People love that movie. No, just the series in general, but yeah, he also directed the movie. Um, now I'm more curious. I haven't seen Neon Genesis uh, Evan- Evangelion. It's, it's depression and puberty, the the anime. Um it's it's definitely something, but mm. if you're if you're looking for like a cool, I don't I don't like things about teenagers. Eh, I I would recommend it if it's one of people like, love it on Twitter. Yeah, that's the thing. Like it's it's an essential anime. Like I would say that and Cowboy Bebop are the two you like need to watch if you want to. That's actually, definitely my impression. Yeah, that in Akira, people talk about Akira. A lot. Akira less so these days. It's more like Akira is a history lesson at this point. It's great, but. Um, and also I would recommend Fooly Cooly. I think that's a short form series that, and then also people really like, um, oh God, who's the guy, uh, Satoshi Khan, the guy who made perfect blue in Tokyo Godfathers, Tokyo Godfathers. Yeah. People yeah. really like that guy. He also made Paprika. <laughs> Wonderful film. Um, yeah, I, Paprika is his by far most well-known work. But he died really young. Yeah. It's unfortunate. It's so funny because. Like, do you think his movies would be go- good to do on the show? I haven't Pap- seen any of his movies. Paprika, one hundred percent, would be great to do on the show. Yeah, I've um, seen clips of Paprika, and it seems insane. It's, it's in a great way. It's really good. Um, that's one of the few like non Ghibli anime movies I think we could get away doing on the show without you looking at me the entire time being like. I don't think anime is inherently bad. Obviously, any sort of genre or form of art is going to have some great examples as ambassadors for it. Yes. You know, which is why, like, well, people always say, like, Ghibli is anime for people who don't like anime. Bebop is anime for people who don't like anime. But Mm -hmm. really, that just means, like, there's not as much tropey stuff that if you're not well versed in anime, you won't get. So it's just like this. This is okay for Western audiences and you'll get it from that film perspective. But yeah, and yet again, I don't watch anime nearly as much as I used to. Like, I don't get into new series anymore because a lot of them are just formulaic and I don't have the time investment to be like, this show's going to go on for 300 episodes. Are you game? I'm like, not really. Can you just fucking... It's just a lot. Yeah. Could just watch like 100 movies instead. One Piece is older than a lot of people I can sell cigarettes to now. So like... 
Can we just fucking... Don't say stuff like that. It makes me want to, like, kill myself right now. <laughs> it is. It's the longest running uh, comic in history. Because even though Superman was invented before it, One Piece, like, it's the same story <laughs> from 96 or 97 till now. Just, it's, it's good on you, Oda. You got a story to tell about pirates and friendship, but maybe wrap it up. Well, he is in the next five years. He said it's going to be done. Oh, we've heard that before. We have, but also he made a promise that I think on his 50th or 55th birthday, he'd take his wife across the world. You got to please your wife. Yeah. So your wife, your wife ain't letting you forget that. And I don't even mean that as a boomer type of joke. It's just like, you got to come on, man. You, you've made like, cause in Japan, like that's bigger than Dragon Ball. Like that's one piece is a cultural phenomenon. It's like you have enough money. <laughs> Take your wife on a nice trip around the world. Yeah. Uh, oh, speaking of romance. Yes. Now, Max, complete non sequitur here. Are you going to drink that mystery drink that I gave you for being late as a punishment? No. I think you should. I don't think I should because it burned my eyes when I sniffed it. It's moonshine. Drink it. Yeah, no, I'm going to drink this nice cocktail that you made anyway. I appreciate the cocktail. We made a cocktail called the Millionaire Cocktail. You can look that up. It's really good. It has egg whites it's in very it. very sweet. Yes. It's kind of like a puree. It's very it's very nice. It's a, kind of a dessert-like cocktail. I don't want to go. I never agreed to travel back into time with you. Give me that moonshine. I'm going to drink that. No, you can have it after the podcast as a treat. No, give it to me now. Come on. Austin, Austin you're, already drunk. Drunk. you're already too drunk. I'm going to get up and get it. Hold on. Oh, can you do it? Can you do it, folks? He's so close. He's about to fall over and break all of our equipment. He just... I just spilled everything. Yeah, he just fucked everything up. Because he couldn't wait. <laughs> There's literally alcohol over all of my equipment. Oh, man. My left ear is no longer receiving sound. This is... No, it still works fine. Okay. It actually helps if you cover your equipment in sake. <laughs> Well, I hope there's a little audio trick for all you people back at home. I think you also closed out our audio program. <laughs> That's not true. Okay, I'll take your word for it. But if this is the last episode of the Spectator Film Podcast, you'll know why. <laughs> because Austin spilled sake over all of our audio equipment during the end of the See, it's still show. recording. Shut okay. Up. <laughs> I scared Austin a lot right there. <laughs> oh, that decay fucking slow mo claymation effect is. It's like Tetsuo the Iron Man. That's great. That is wonderful filmmaking. Oh, time to go back. Just need to make sure that Morlock dies. Wow, that is powerful. I'm glad you decided to make such a big hullabaloo <laughs> just to drink something. You back. could have given it to me. No, oh, you were right, Austin. What? It was in the year 800,000, not 80,000. See, I'm not drunk. No, you're drunk. You just... We're right about that one thing. There's a difference. My question is, why did he go to five days after? Well, because he had he, made he, he had made dinner plans with them already. He fucking remembered that. It's only been a, a day and a half at most. You know what? That's really interesting, Max. This movie kind of occurs in real time. Not even. Like it takes him. He's there for the end of the day, through the night, and then the next day. But I mean, like, we're with this character for the entire duration of their time there. Yeah. It's kind of like a real-time movie, you know what I mean? To a degree, yeah. It's a little sped up at some points, but, like... I mean, night, sure. The night goes by very quickly. Yeah, like, like we cut from one scene to the next, but it's like... The diegetic space is continuous, for the most part, when we enter the flashback out of the framing device. I love this. I'm just like, I'm too tired to go around the front door. Let's just fucking break the window. <laughs> just break the window and horrify my maid. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and casual. I love it. It is very casual. You just <laughs> burst the window open.
By the way, Max, you never answered that question you brought up earlier of what time you would travel to. Um, there's a lot of interesting times in history that I'd love to see, like for myself. Like, you got one off the top of your head? Um, I got several off the top of my head. Am okay. I allowed to do that? Yeah, go for it. Um, I one I'd like to just go back to the 1917 Russian Revolution to just see all sorts of things that were happening. Cause just to feel that alive. Not even that, but just also there's like all sort of historical discrepancies from Eastern and Western. Yeah, so yeah, it's just, just about to see it. what happens. See, see the legit thing of what happened. God, um, I would love to see Lenin. And other than that, like I would want to go back like much farther. I'd want <laughs> want to see what the Mongols were like. I'd want to see some like Mesoamerican civilizations yeah, at their yeah height. Oh my God, that's a good one. Because God only knows how much we've diminished their civilizations through some sort of racism. Yeah, I wonder what they were actually like. Would you see a dinosaur? I mean, that's a given. That's a given for anybody. I don't know if I brought this up on the show before, but I, as a kid, was so obsessed with dinosaurs that I actually bought dinosaur fossils. Yeah. And by that, I mean, I like made $50 on a lemonade stand, and then my parents helped me <laughs> buy dinosaur fossils on the internet uh, like 20 years ago. But I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I... Seeing a dinosaur in real life would, like, probably kill me. Well, it'd also kill you because they probably look like gigantic birds. You'd be like, that's not what Jurassic Park told me they look like. No, I mean, I... See, I was obsessed with Jurassic Park, but also I knew... That was, like, even as a little kid, I was, like, forming a hipster tendency where it's like, well, actually, they wouldn't have feathers on them. Jurassic Park is, like, mostly correct, but... Uh, they would actually have more feathers on them. They wouldn't like because Jurassic Park gets it right that they're birds. Because you have that scene right at the beginning with that kid who's like, "What's that? Like a six foot turkey?" And then <laughs> Sam Neill has to like emotionally disturb him by <laughs> pretending to be a velociraptor and cutting him <laughs> <his> stomach. <laughs> Sam Neill's such a great actor. I love Sam Neill. Sam Neill's great. Have you ever seen the movie Possession? Uh, yes, a while ago. Oh. Love that movie. Sam Neill is so awesome. I fucking love Sam Neill. We got to do a new Sam Neill movie. Why not? Next time on the podcast, we're going to start our month of Sam Neill. Sam Neill, we're going to do... Sam Neill, you bury. What? It's February for Sam Neill. <laughs> this is our A game, folks. It's the end of the movie. The Sam... ending of this movie is bad, by the way. I want to say that. Why do you think so? Um, it doesn't stick the landing at all. It's if we want to. I thought you thought it was nice and sentimental. No, I said it would have been nice and sentimental. Oh, if we had something like the little gadget showing up at the end to be like, right? Oh, we're not sure if it's real, but hey, let's believe. But instead, we get this silly like, oh, he's disappeared and he must have done this. And again, it's it's. It's making up for, like, I don't know. It, it's betraying, like, a lack of trust in the audience by having an abundance of, of exposition about it, you know? Where what you're saying is, like, hey, if we just showed the, you know, miniature show up again, that's just a really decisive visual cue that is, like, a nice ribbon. Yeah. To tie around everything. He wasn't crazy. All this stuff happened. Yeah. And now... He's got the last laugh and his friend, at least one of his friends for sure believes him. But I, I agree with you. But of course, the reason why they didn't do that is I think because of this movie being kind of like an urtext landmark point for time travel movies. Uh, I think we can assume based on the amount of exposition that they give at the beginning and throughout the movie that uh, they weren't really sure about how audience was audiences would take all this time travel stuff despite the fact of the novel being a huge hit for the better part of a hundred years by the time that this movie was made you know yeah i i will say this this actor the scottish actor he's i would say probably the best actor in the film mainly because his scottish accent is very charming and i like him but you know it's interesting and i don't know if this means anything but in the world war one scene I noticed that his son character no longer has a Scottish accent. I thought that was interesting. 
He has to pretend to be English in order to fit in. I thought that was interesting in terms of like, if you wanted to read into this movie, maybe there's something with like empire or something going on with this movie. I feel like this movie is mostly apolitical. So it's a little bit more challenging to draw out political conclusions from about that, or at least it's trying to be apolitical. Um, This is the weirdest ending where there's three books, but she doesn't know which ones he took into the future. Now it's just the question of like, what three books would you bring with you? That's the thing where I'm saying like it's apolitical. It's not like he took like a communist manifesto <laughs> and brought it into the future. You know, there's no clear incl- inclination of what it is. Well, it's just such a weird place to end it. But he's got plenty of time. <laughs> maybe it's a thing with the book, though. If we, if either of us had read the book, maybe him taking the three books. No, because I don't. Listen, it's all fair and well when things are based off of books, but like, I want this to hold together as a film. That's a good point, uh, and then that's something we stress on a lot of episodes on the show, especially you know with movies that are very conspicuously like adaptations of things, where it's like, listen, the movie is the movie, and I don't care about the book, even if I'm the huge fan of it. It's a different thing. It's a complimentary thing, and we're reviewing the movie. We're not talking about the book. Um, but I don't know, maybe it would still provide some sort of insight. I don't know. I don't know, but we'll never know because the movie's over. It is over. But Max, what'd you, what'd you think of watching it this time around? What'd you, what'd you think of this? Even uh, though we were talking over it? Uh, still, it's, it's remarkably fine. I appreciate it for <laughs> kickstarting time travel stories back in the day. Um, yet again, as I've said, I love the special effects, but I don't feel too different about it. I feel like Rod Taylor is a very boring lead. Yeah. Um, this was his first uh, leading role in a motion major picture. I should probably have started with that. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh. Um, it was definitely before The Birds, so. Yes. And then after The Birds. Eh. But it's it's remarkably okay all around. And, like, it's funny because I've always said, like, you shouldn't take Rotten Tomatoes scores too seriously at all unless they're, like, don't take them seriously. Take them as what they are. Yeah, take yeah. them. Don't take them seriously, except for when you do. But like this had a seventy six on Rotten Tomatoes, um, and I was like, oh come on! But that's like a classic, fun like fundamental story. Because even if I hadn't seen this movie in forever, like it still gets brought up a lot. It's the time machine. Yeah, yeah. But upon watching it, I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's fair. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fair. It's not. Although it was a landmark film, it's not super interesting and it's more the discussions that you can have because of the movie are more interesting but that's also true for almost any time travel film you know what i would say though if i was a kid seeing this in the theater in 1960 it would be awesome yeah i would love that i can totally understand being a kid in 1960 completely falling head over heels in love with this movie and then um, fucking Dr. Doolittle came out and i would never want to see a movie again <laughs> what talking about movies that came out in the 60s okay this movie give I think it's just because of his suit. It gives me major Doctor Doolittle vibes. I am totally bad. I was not prepared for you to bring up Doctor Doolittle. Okay. Well, on that note, you've been listening to the Spectator Film Podcast. <laughs> you can find us on SpectatorFilmPodcast dot com. Uh, you can listen to us on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever the fuck you can find podcasts. You can find us. Uh, be sure to hit us up on all of our various social media, especially Instagram. We'll probably respond to you there. And Tweet at us. Yes. And we've also got that letterbox. Check that out. Hell yeah. Where you can see all the movies we've done uh, in a very organized and neat fashion. And, uh, of course, you can find out we have different lists that we've made as well. Maybe we'll make more lists, too. Well, but so far, we have lists about like which movies either of us have chosen. And, and then uh, I, I can't remember. So, So, yeah. yeah. Austin, any last words before you spill more alcohol over our equipment? I'm going to... You're just giving yourself so much work, and I know (laughs) you're not going to edit this out. (laughs) I have to. It's a felony. (laughs) Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.